this one will do. If we look into the HTML, um, it uses uh, this very old-fashioned tag, custom tagging. So pound tag pound host is going to be it's going to run an on tag event handler at the in the Delphi, and it can replace that tag string with the actual value. Now this is good, but is is very limited in what you can do. So I added the the, the scripting that again I showed earlier in the plenary session, the scripting to really get much beyond the simple single value mapping. So I can map object dot value or I can map lists and it handles that lists of, it handles T list, so a list of objects and it handles data sets in terms of listing and a number of things. So it can help you generating some of the HTML because you still, I mean, yes, you can do everything. You can have an empty HTML page and then make 10 requests to your REST server and populate everything. But there are reasons for actually generating some of the HTML. One of them is be, so that search engines can actually find that information. Because everything dynamic is fine, but if you like creating a blog, that will be Google will never be able to index your blog if it's completely REST-based. Since you want Google to index your blog because that's where you get the readers, you want that to be, to use a different model, so server-side HTML generation. So to some extent, this adds uh, server-side HTML uh, generation. Okay, so let's look at an actual example that I have. I have a bunch. This is actually out of, it's in the, in the repository. Uh, well, a slightly older version, but whatever. Um, so, well, let's first look at what's in the source. Uh, well, no, let's do it the other way. Open the example and then look at the source. Um, so the relic source code that you can get on the, in the repository has uh, an active record unit for the active record mapping, defines a bunch of attributes that determine what you map to the DB, what you map to the user interface, what you map in both directions, what is in memory only. You have kind of, it's kind of a little messed up, but we have three attributes for the mapping. Um, what well, the component registration, there is a configuration helper for reading an ini file, getting the database setting, just simplifying these kind of things. Uh, overall database access layer where you have your SQL connection component and, and things like that. Um, dynamic server class, that rather than having the, the server classes, because after a while you had, you, had, you had like with five server classes each for a family of methods, so you can actually have dynamic server classes, that was brought by a demo by Andrea Lanus. Uh, there is a specific unit for mapping to JQuery Grid, which I'm going to demonstrate. There is a simple helper to sending an email, whatever. Uh, there is the script processing, the Razor uh, script processing. This uses the, the notation, the at notation. That's I cloned, without even trying to hide it, the Razor notation, that's the new notation in ASP.NET that Microsoft is pushing along. Because using tags is kind of annoying. It's actually at something is, is quite a nice, it's a, quite a nice notation. And I've cloned like 20% of what Razor does in ASP.NET, but the, the, the nice 20%. I mean, the most important 20% kind. Sessions management, uh, table module is the other data mismapping. We have the active record and the table module. Uh, a custom web module that is still kind of in flux. And the web UI is where you get all of the Automatic generation, generating the uh, object, to, uh, object to JSON, automatic UI, and the validation, which is the other thing I haven't, I haven't mentioned. There's full validation support uh, in, uh, in the system. Again, validation means you define the rules in attributes, and the JavaScript is generated. Because you don't want to have for each field to write the custom JavaScript validation. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. So the idea is use attributes to the max. That's kind of the core idea. So this is my active record. This is the class. I have a wizard to generate it out of the database. And you can see I've used the wizard because I would never have a typed employee underscore no uppercase, but that's what the wizard does. And I have to fix the wizard, of course. But then we have uh, uh, other things like I don't want to edit the employee number. That's, it's, it's vital. I need it on the server because that's my key, but I don't want it to put it in the user interface. So the user interface generator and the JSON generator, you will not get that information in, um, well, you get it in JSON, but not in the UI, actually, because you need it in JSON to, to send the information back. And here is a simple validation, valid true. 
meaning it's compulsory. Okay? Or valid false means it's optional. Well, whatever. I don't know what's the default. And you can say valid email, valid. Uh, there are, uh, if it's a number, like, uh, is there a number? Yeah, this is a small in. So it automatically says, hey, yeah, it has to be a number. So you don't have to say it needs to be a number. It's a number. Uh, dates we don't handle, sorry. And, and the other thing you can do, you can attach a name of a function. So for complex validation, you just attach a name of a function, and the REST service, when it has to validate, it will call your service and say, hey, is this good? Like uh, that number, a fiscal code, or uh, anything extra. Oh, is this user ID still in my database? That's the done I've, I've done two days ago, or anything like that. And the last thing, when you have like password, repeat password, that's built into the system. So you say, this is a repeat field, and it, it, it works. So you just declare these things. This class is really empty. It doesn't do much. OK, it has this custom mapping. The key, the, the, because it, by default, it expects the ID to be called ID table name. This is not because it's called employee number. Fine, let, this is the name of the, of the table. So that's the class. And then, basically, what I have is server methods that will, I have a server method that will get an employee. And we simply say, OK, this is the employee ID. Get the employee as an employee and return the JSON. That's, that's two lines. And with these two lines, well, I have to go to the second page. Uh, with these two lines, uh, wait, fine. It was started. That's cute. OK. Uh, well, I get to this page next. Uh, with these two lines, you get this view. This is your, your object, the data of your object. Okay. Now, the map, this page actually has a little bit more. This is kind of a, could be Im implemented with tabs, but it's, it just uses buttons. So this is the view, and you have a bit of HTML for the view, but then in the same page, I'm not changing page, there is the editing HTML. So you can move from view to, so it, the, the mapping is slightly more complex because it has to map the fields to the view and to the, uh, to the edit fields. Of course, you can change everything. I mean, but that this lets you update while well, create. It doesn't make much sense. But create a new object or update the object. So let's call him Johnny. And we just do an update. And we'll update and get back to the, to the view page. And that's some, there is some default JavaScript that does this little bit. So you just have to kind of copy and paste it around. But that's out of basically this function to get it and this update function. And what this does, it reads the data from the database. It reads the JSON object that is sent from, from the JavaScript with the update data. And then update will generate the SQL update statement. So get the original values from the database apply the updates from the user interface, send the new object to the DB, and that's it. So it's three lines of code. OK. Now, the other thing that this program does is showing the table. And that's actually quite nice, because if we get back to the employee list, we have this table. This is paged. We should go for a smaller page. So we can actually move from one page to the next page. It allows sorting on each field, decreasing and increasing. Ah, OK. Well, and then when you click, you get into one of the details. So, and this is page, so it could be 1 million records. And you can just even page through them and, and do. But when you sort, it does another query. So the data is not kept in memory. It really generates new database queries every time. The idea, uh, now this is kind of an aside, and I have like two minutes for it. but. Um, I've been using uh, instant objects and other object relational mappers and other things like that. Uh, and I like them. They're very good. But I think they, they are not the right metaphor for web application, even if Microsoft uses entity relation under ASP.NET. I think that's crazy. Because in web applications, I mean, what, do you want to get this list of this list of employee and keep them in memory just in case the user clicks? on that button again, the user might be gone. And you have to wait like 20 minutes before you say, oh, no, it's gone. So with this 20 megabytes in memory for 20 minutes, because the user might use it, this website will never scale, will never work. 
the successful model has been active record in like in, in Ruby on Rails and other systems because that's grab the data from the DB, keep it in memory just for doing a bit of logical object-oriented processing, return it, and that's gone. You don't keep objects, you don't keep the data in memory. So you have really to be very, very minimal in what you move around. And that's, that is this approach. I think that for a web-oriented application, for a REST service, this approach makes more sense than creating a big table mapping in memory. Now, in other situations, that's better, but in, in and again, that's one of the reasons Ruby on Rail model and the lightweight database access models tends to be very successful. And I mean, in memory, I have like the object ID and a couple of things. I keep very little. So, so that's also why when I do the update, I read the object back because I haven't kept it. Yes, I did return that object, but it's now gone. Because I don't know if the user will do an update or not. Why do I need to keep the object in memory? If, the user, if I need it, I can fetch it from the DB. The DB is closed, it's fast. It's much faster going back and forth to the DB than going back and forth to the user. It's not even comparable. So, and I don't want to keep like lots of data in memory for each possible next request by, by each of my thousands of users. I don't have. <laughs> uh, so that's the, the idea. So again, this doesn't cache on, on the server. What it does on the server, well, this is the code you have to implement for now. I'm going to make it better. So I have this employee table method. This is the server-side method. I create a list of fields that I want out of the database fields. And then what I do, I create a table, uh, a jQuery grid supported table. So I have this helper class, well, which it doesn't open because it's running. Uh, so I have to say the table is employee. I don't want all fields, only these fields. And the same fields must be quoted in the, in, the HTML, in the JavaScript, which again, something that could be kind of automated a little bit. So right now there is a bit of duplication. You have to have these fields in the JavaScript UI and the same fields uh, on the server. Um, so, and I'm using uh, creating from a table. You can also create from a query. It will try to add to customize the where statement automatically, but I'm not sure it always works. And then it uses the extra input parameters like the sorting field, the number of the page you get as extra parameters. And that's one of the reasons it was troublesome to do this in, in Delphi XE because it will not allow the extra parameters. So the fields list is processed. Wow, let's stop this. In here, OK, um, it saves the table name. And then it saves what well, wrong place. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. It gets the. It reads the field. The, um, it reads the fields, and when it assigns the fields. Okay. Um, yeah. The fields include. It processes the parameters, and the parameters include the actual page you want, the row limit, the sorting order, so the sorting field. Uh, and also filters. You can also do filtering. Okay, filter all only the employee in this city with this with string matching, and it supports multiple filters that we don't support yet. But that's the idea. So filtering, sorting, it's all built into and all. Now I'm wondering if this makes sense. Yeah. Okay, because it's sort direction and it's sort. Okay, that's why the D. And so you get these input parameters, and you use them to create the uh, where the where statement. So basically, the where close is this filters to where. It uses the filters to create a proper a proper uh, where statement. Um, okay. So like for the filter. And the, the order by, oh, well, no, that's the like and, and the filter, and then there's the order by uh, somewhere else. So with, but the code you really have to do is, is a bit of code, but not a lot of code. Uh, and that's it. And that lets you have uh, this string grid with filtering, sorting, uh, ordering, and then when you click on a button, you can intercept it with an event hand with with a JavaScript event handler right? to show that other page do something else. It even supports in place editing, but it's kind of a hack. Now there is a new jQuery uh, official 
jQuery UI grid that's coming along. So I might kind of trash jQuery grid and move to the new one. But it's kind of still not ready. It's still in process. Um, okay, so that's the kind of, this is kind of an overview. And again, if you go to the website, there is a, a PDF, a 20 pages PDF. There is, there are some examples. There is the entire source code. And uh, there are currently three people actively contributing, but the more the better. <laughs> there, is, there is unit testing for most of it, not 100% coverage, but it's kind of 80% coverage is covered by unit testing. So every time I do things, I crash the unit testing. There is translation support. Again, using the, the, the razor, you can, rather than using a, a string, you use, use at lang and, and the name. So you have this, the names in the database. So in the database, you have a table, name, language. This is the translation. So it's fully translatable. And razor allows for multiple processing. So you can ask for a value. You get the value of a field. And the value of a field, rather than having the text, has the ID of the translated element. So it will process it again. Or at the opposite, you, inside the translation, you can have symbolic references to fields. Because at times, you have to create a sentence, my, uh, my uh, nice, uh, I don't know, house. Or in Italian, you have to reverse the words. So if you have to grab those words, uh, you might want to create the sentence differently. So you first go for the translation and then retrieve the individual field name. So it, you can go both directions. You can actually kind of infinitely keep looping until there is a symbol in the result of the symbol in the result. Uh, so there's translation support. There are a few other features that are built into. And I have to say we also have, it's not part of the system, but it might eventually get into it. We have uh, PayPal integration, which was very hard to achieve. But we have full PayPal integration. So the entire payment process, PayPal will call us, call the Delta application when there is an event on the server. So it's not just you get out after the payment. It's just full. PayPal notification, the IPN system. It was quite an effort. But because PayPal is totally undocumented, so well, that's well, the big thing. <laughs> it was an effort. Uh, yep, so that's, that's the idea. And I think this model overall, I mean, there are multiple ways of doing it. This is just one of the ways. But the model of having a Delphi strong server-side application, Java suite of the client, I think using Delphi to kind of to avoid having to manually write the entire JavaScript UI and do all of the mapping manually is, is, is relevant. I mean, using any library that does, that helps bridging, because otherwise the JavaScript side will be extremely tedious and time consuming to, to, to create. Uh, but with an approach like this, I mean this or something similar, uh, you can really create uh, web applications uh, reasonably fast. I'm creating my new online shop. Uh, I'm creating a couple of other sites, and, and it's, again, at times I find things that are missing, I add them. Uh, I haven't tried to create a comprehensive solution and then create the demos. We implement features as they are needed. So some areas are lacking because we don't need them. Someone needs it. Well, we can go ahead and put it in. So it's really a minimalistic approach. But it, it's great. Okay. I mean, I don't have extra time for building it the best framework. I'm building something that works for what I need. That's the idea. OK. Well, email is always good for any question, so feel free to ask. <laughs>